history, <clears throat> the motive for most wars or conflicts has or have usually come down to two basic subjects. One would be travel or the ability to move uh, one's person or themselves and other people around the world, right? Across the seas or the land or in the air. And transportation or the ability to carry things while traveling across the land, across the sea, or across the air. And usually, most fighting has revolved around these two subjects. The ability to travel and the ability to carry things while traveling. To start with, we'll read a portion of a book. It's called The God Kings and the Titan by James Bailey. New World Ascendancy in Ancient Times. This book's copyright 1973 by James Bailey. All rights reserved for information rights. St. Lawrence Press Incorporated. Uh, Fifth Avenue, New York. Printed in Great Britain, Library of Congress, catalog number. First published in London in the United States of America in 1973. Affiliated publishers, Macmillan Limited, London. Also Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, and Melbourne. Here on page 118. Herodotus takes the origins of the war and Persians fought against the Greeks a long way back in history. He finds the origins of the European-Asian rivalry, which has been a fact of Mediterranean politics over the last 4,000 years, and trouble over women. Cherchez la femme. It starts, he says, with the Phoenicians stealing Io, daughter of the Hellenic king Anagius, or Nacus. Subsequently, certain Hellens, probably Cretans, carried off the Phoenician king of Tyre's daughter Europa. The Hellens were then the authors of a second instance of violence, which they came in a longship to Aea on the river Phasis in Colchis, which Professor Mert supposes, as we shall show in Appendix 1, was a river in South America, and carried off the king's daughter Medea. Alexander, son of Priam, Priam, having heard of all this, decided to steal Helena, and thus Herodotus says began the Mycenaean campaign against Troy. Herodotus continues now, the Phoenicians hold a, it a crime of a wicked man to ravish women, but that of a simpleton to trouble oneself about revenge. Perhaps the women provided the excuse, not the reason. For whatever the truth of these tales, Herodotus suggests a long-lasting European-Asian rivalry, surely a matter of power and trade rather than women, which arose out of friction between them from the East Mediterranean to their trading stations in America, rivalry that led, among things, to the fall of Troy. That line there tells you basically what has been obfuscated in most textbooks, which is that um, <clears throat> that most rivalries or conflicts come down to power and trade rather than women, which would suggest, of course, that what was stolen were actually women, but rather ships. Ships have long taken the names of women, such as the Lydia, John Hancock, and of course, women have been named after ships, uh, and other types of things like that. Now, nobody today would look at the Statue of Liberty and say, that's a depiction of a literal individual. Yet, with all these other statues today, that's what we're trained to do. Look at them and say, that's a statue of a literal individual who was the daughter of so-and-so and was captured and led to the war with Troy. But if you compare it to other things, then you realize the truth of the matter, which is that they were fighting over the same things that we're still fighting on to, over today, which is the ability to trade, carry things, and travel. So then we jump ahead in our perspective of time to... Trade and Empire, the British Customs Service in Colonial America, 1660 through 1775. Thomas C. Barrow, Harvard University Press, Cambridge, Massachusetts, 1967. Copyright, 1967, by the President and Fellows of Harvard College, all rights reserved. Distributed in Great Britain by Oxford University Press, London. Library of Congress, blah, blah, blah. Printed in the United States of America. Here on page 256 and 257. In any list of grievances drawn up by the colonists to explain the reasons for the open rupture, the operation of the Customs Service ranked high. 
An American reading that passage in the Declaration of Independence, which denounces the king because he had erected a multitude of new offices and sent hither swarms of officers to harass our people and eat out their substance, would understand this reference to the customs officials. More specifically, the complaints in the Declaration that the colonists had been deprived in many cases of the benefits of trial by jury and transported beyond seas to be tried for pretend offenses singled out the Admiralty Court system, which was a major element in the customs apparatus, and the whole purpose, the basic function of the Customs Service, was protested in the Declaration when the colonists complained that the King had combined with others to subject us to a jurisdiction foreign to our Constitution, giving his assent to their acts pretend legislation for cutting off our trade with all parts of the world. That last line is what the War for Independence had to do with. Trade with all parts of the world. It was a contest over those two things, the ability to travel and the ability to carry things while traveling. And of course sell those things or trade them. These were specific grievances ones Americans could understand but in a larger sense, the Customs Service played a central role in the coming of the Revolution, as it did in the history of the First British Empire, because its operation was relative, related directly to the procurement of revenue, which in essence was and is the key to effective government. And, of course, that part in there is probably put in there so that the author doesn't get in trouble with the current revenue collectors that we have today doing essentially the same things that they were then, and all on behalf of foreign interests. Now we're going to look at a newspaper called The Commercial, out of Wilmington, North Carolina, Saturday, March 11th, 1854. Here, under one section, it states, Riots on the Pacific Railroad, the laborers on the Pacific Railroad near St. Louis, have lately been concerned in a series of riots. Some of the overseers have been whipped, one or two of the contractors threatened with violence, the citizens of property along the line depredated on, and worse than all, several persons have been found murdered on the railroad. On the road. Then we have this section, which is a different part, but seems to be connected. The body of Hilliard Reed, a free mulatto, who had been employed on board the railroad company's steamer, was found this morning floating in the northeast river just above the company's wharves. We learn that when last seen, he was quite drunk, and the probability is that he fell into the river and got drowned while in a state of intoxication. Or, more than likely, was one of the murdered on the road. So, we'll look at the Wikipedia article on Pinkertons. Now, it is Wikipedia, so, you know, grain of salt and all that, and um, pretty much everything on Wikipedia is lying. Just like most of the major hits on Google. But it can help for our establishing of a pattern, anyway. Pinkerton is a private security guard and detective agency established around 1850 in the United States by Scottish-born American Cooper Allen Pinkerton and Chicago attorney Edward Rucker. As the Northwestern Police Agency, which later became Pinkerton and Company, and finally the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. At the height of its power from 1870s to the 1890s, it was the largest private law enforcement organization in the world. It's currently a subsidiary of Swedish-based Securitas AB. So here's uh, a couple notes here. Every so-called law enforcement that we have in the United States are corporate. That means that they are running for-profit businesses. They are essentially thugs of a private law agency carrying out foreign code. It's a conglomeration of internationalists and their minions who are carrying out their law on all parts of the world, basically. And there's no such thing as a public government or republic, right? It's all private corporations on behalf of other private corporations, which generally speaking lead back to Europe and the United Nations and uh, the Vatican. This is just a precursor to the widespread so-called law enforcement of private nature today. Pinkerton became famous when he claimed to have foiled the Baltimore plot to assassinate President-elect Abraham Lincoln in 1861. Lincoln later hired Pinkerton agents to conduct espionage against the Confederacy and act as his personal security during the American Civil War. And one, of course, has to wonder about the legitimacy and truth behind that. 
because the character of Lincoln is a very suspicious one. Following the Civil War, the Pinkertons began conducting operations against organized labor. During the labor strikes in the late 19th and early 20th centuries, businesses hired the Pinkerton Agency to infiltrate unions, supply guards, keep strikers and suspected unionists out of factories, and recruit goon squads to intimidate workers. That kind of sounds like what the labor unions do today. During the Homestead Strike of 1892, Pinkerton agents were called in to reinforce the strike-breaking measures of industrialist Henry Clay Fick, Frick, who was acting on behalf of Andrew Carnegie, the head of Carnegie Steel. Tensions between the workers and strike-breakers erupted in violence, which led to the deaths of three Pinkerton agents and nine steel workers. During the late 19th century, the Pinkertons were also hired as guards in coal, iron, and lumber disputes in Illinois, Michigan, New York, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia, and were involved in other strikes as the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. And, of course, that's an example of selecting the lesser of many evils and putting it up there so that it doesn't sound like they were that bad. During the 20th century, Pinkerton rebranded itself as a personal security risk management firm. I don't know how you could do that, but okay. The company has continued to exist in various forms to the present day and is now a division of the Swedish security company, Securitas AB, operating as Pinkerton Consulting and Investigations Incorporated, doing business as Pinkerton Corporate Risk Management. The former Pinkerton Government Services Division, PGS, now operates as Securitas Critical Infrastructure Services Incorporated. So that's interesting. That's a, a major entity and player in the United States that is overtly uh, subsidiary of a foreign corporation. Now, in some sense, all of our phony governments are overt subsidiaries, if you were to read the court case for, by the uh, International Code Council. However, this entity appears to be, anyway, the first one that was... Um, it is, at least as far as Wikipedia and all the other nonsense goes, openly stated as being part of a foreign corporation, but it doesn't really talk about the implications of such a thing. Whereas all of the other former important players in old United States history, anyway, appear to have been incorporated or reincorporated or have their name changed, but essentially still be operating in the United States under different names. So... This one, I'm sure, still operates in the United States, but it is considered to be the precursor to Secret Service, but I would more than likely say this is more like the precursor to our phony law enforcement that we have today, or at least our uh, law enforcement of foreign codes and enemies of the U.S. Constitution and therefore every member that takes an oath of allegiance. Origins in the 1850s, Alan Pinkerton, a Scottish immigrant, met Chicago attorney Edward Rucker in a local Masonic hall. Big surprise. Two men formed the Northwestern Police Agency, later known as the Pinkerton Agency. Now, I highly doubt that they named it the Northwestern Police Agency, because one has to wonder whether or not that word use of police was um, commonly used at the time. Because police comes from police, French uh, version of policy that we have, which means something a little different. Now, that word probably was used, as I've noticed it in different French contexts, but I don't believe it was used in the same way that we use it. So one might look at those old documents and read that word and think one thing, but they actually meant something else. Pinkerton used his skills in espionage to attract clients and began growing the agency. Historian Frank Morin writes, By the mid-1850s, a few business businessmen saw the need for greater control over their employees. Their solution was to sponsor a private detective system. They're not really private detectives. That's a cover front, a lie, basically. In February 1855, Alan Pinkerton, after consulting with six Midwestern railroads, created such an agency in Chicago. The Pinkerton Agency began to hire women and minorities shortly after its founding because they were useful spies practicing common at the time. And that's probably a lie. Now, the reason why this would blatantly state that they were formed in on a call and they were Masons is because even still today, Masons, FBI, and CIA are purported as heroes and quote unquote national treasures. So here, it states four runs to the Secret Service, although I'd say the Pinkertons are more akin to uh, uh, 
collaboration of the CIA and FBI, even though the CIA and FBI basically do the same things. Probably are the same people, just operate under different letterheads. And they use, of course, the local forces as their foot soldiers, the so-called police and sheriffs, etc. Among the business's early operations was to deli safely deliver the newly elected President of the United States, Abraham Lincoln, to Washington, D.C. In light of the assassination threat, Pinkerton detective Kate Warren was assigned and successfully delivered Lincoln to the U.S. Capitol through a series of disguises and related tactics that required her to stay awake throughout the entire long journey. As a result of the public notoriety of this success, the business adopted an open eye as its logo and the slogan, We Never Sleep. And of course, most would recognize that as the all-seeing eye that is equally on our uh, crap currency that we use, the bill of uh, tender treasury notes that are just debt instruments and not real money. And of course, the all-seeing eye is very well known uh, in correlation to the Masonic Lodges. Alan Pinkerton around this time also served as the Secret Service Intelligence Division, what was then known as the U.S. War Department. Except it wasn't called the U.S. War Department because it's called the Grand Army of the Republic. So, according to the U.S. Code, no less. These actions proceeded and laid the groundwork for the establishment of the United States Secret Service, which was tasked with serving current and former U.S. President's security to this day. The official Secret Service was founded on July 5, 1865, less than three months after the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. In 1871, Congress appropriated 50000 about equivalent to... 1,272,000 in 2023. It's interesting that they're referencing that. That means this document was re written relatively recent by one of those liars that work in the phony government, like that lady that bragged to me. She was a Wikipedia admin, worked at the Ohio State House. To the new Department of Justice to form a sub organization devoted to the detection and prosecution of those guilty of violating federal law. Not the U.S. Constitution, mind you. Those guilty of violating foreign codes basically. That's another way that that could be written. It's more accurate. The amount was insufficient to form an internal investigation unit, so they contracted out to the services of the Pinkerton National Detective Agency. And I'm sure that's a lie. They all used the Pinkertons. It wasn't about a contracting out to them. This was one of their mechanized entities to enforce their takeover. However, as news leaked about the Pinkertons' involvement in strike breaking, which of course makes this en entity an insurrectionist Group. Lawmakers began pushing against government contracts with Pinkerton. Pinkertons reached their zenith in the 1870s and 80s, which saw them frequently engage in violent crackdowns against striking workers. The most notable example of this was the involvement of the Pinkertons in the Great Railroad Strike of 1877. That specific one has been cited twice in this article and highlighted out. I wonder why. However, it was a confrontation in Homestead, Pennsylvania in 1892 that led to a national outcry against the Pinkerton Detective Agency. National outcry, yeah, right. Following the strike, Congress took swift action against the Pinkertons and passed the Anti-Pinkerton Act in 1893, which severely curtailed the relationship between the federal government and the agency. The act states that individuals employed by the Pinkerton Detective Agency or similar organization may not be employed by the government of the United States or the government of the District of Columbia. And that's kind of interesting because one has to wonder what exactly they're talking about there. Also, it's interesting that they specifically cite the government of the District of Columbia. So either they're talking about the delineation between the constitutional government, which no longer longer exists, basically it doesn't theory, or they're talking and in correlation they're also talking about the U.S. Code government based out of the District of Columbia. Or they're talking equally about the U.S. Code government that is based around the United States, controlled by the U.S. Code government situated in the District of Columbia. So it's always hard to tell because they only reference themselves. So it's probably the second one because they like to ignore anything else that isn't part of their scheme. Now, there's a book that's particularly helpful called The Titan. Or just Titan. The Life of John D. Rockefeller Sr. Now, one of the most important parts in this book, well, actually, there are two, and which are directly counter to the official narrative around this particular individual, 
Well, the first is the fact that his father was a grifter who would go around and swindle other people and also kept a separate family somewhere else. Sounds like what is often talked about in reference to the Rothschild. Most of the stuff, if you look up about it, will say that his father was a medical man and a bunch of other nonsense. Well, that, of course, was one of the covers that he went under to sell, go around selling people false promises and things like that. And Rockefeller, his original business interests were floated by money that was funneled through the church that he was going to. And that is a classic tactic used by the Masonic Order. They run the churches, essentially, and they filter all of their stuff through them, and the churches are protected uh, through religious fervor, essentially. And they were essentially behind the uh, uh, instigated conflict between so-called Catholics and Protestants uh, prior to the Civil War, which would suggest that they were, in fact, behind the execution of the Civil War, so-called, in order to impose foreign rule and supplant or foment an insurrection against the legitimate constitutional government. However, as we'll see here, and we saw before in that Wikipedia article, Rockefeller and his partners all used the Pinkerton Agency. And he it was not, in fact, in opposition to the phony government, and neither were his partners. They were all working together. There is simply an imposed overlay, facade, or lie of conflict between these individuals. They were all Masons. They all worked together against everybody else. They were agents of foreign interests. So here the next person, Cornelius Vanderbilt, May 27, 1794, to January 4, 1877, nicknamed the Commodore, was an American business magnate who built his wealth in railroads and shipping. Now it's reported, not in most places though, that Vanderbilt gave specifically Standard Oil Company, or the company with Rockefeller as the face, special uh, rates for traveling across the railways, which were offered to no other oil companies. And thus, the competitors to Standard Oil and Rockefeller, which were pretty much all of them, they built the pipelines, which were then taken over by the phony government. And Cornelius Vanderbilt, as well as Rockefeller, were in fact protected by that phony government. After working with his father's business, Vanderbilt worked his way into leadership positions in the inland water trade. Yeah, that's no surprise. Shut down a co competing travel mechanism and transport mechanism and invested in the rapidly growing railroad industry, effectively transforming the geography of the United States. As one of the richest Americans in history and wealthiest figures overall, Vanderbilt was the patriarch of the wealthy and influential Vanderbilt family. He provided the initial gift to found Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, according to historian H. Roger Grant. And of course, as we'll know, all of these people had uh, a lot of work to do with universities and education, and the medical industry, especially with uh, Rockefeller and the, um, uh, whatever that hospital is called, I don't remember. Contemporaries too often hated or feared Vanderbilt, or at least considered him an unmannered brute. While Vanderbilt could be a rascal, combative, and cunning, he was much more a builder than a wrecker, being honorable, shrewd, and hardworking. And of course, that would have been written in the relation to the Masonic Order being uh, full of uh, angels and heroes. Then we have Andrew Carnegie, November 25th through 18, 1835 through August 11th, 1919, was a Scottish-American industrialist and philanthropist. Carnegie led the expansion of the American steel industry in the late 19th century and became one of the richest Americans in history. He became a leading philanthropist in the United States, Great Britain, and the British Empire. During the last 18 years of life, his life, he gave away around blah, blah, blah. He didn't give anything away. It, it all got laundered. Almost 90% of his fortune to charities, foundations, universities. There you go, universities and, of course, medical 
the medical industry. His 1889 article proclaiming the gospel of wealth called on the rich to use their wealth to improve society, expressed support from progressive taxation, and an estate tax, and stimulated a wave of philanthropy. So yeah, so another foreign agent carrying out their foreign operation against, uh, or their foreign insurrection, as it were. Then we have John Pierpont Morgan, was an American financier and investment banker who dominated corporate finance on Wall Street throughout the Gilded Age and Progressive Era. As the head of the banking firm that ultimately became known as J.P. Morgan & Company, he was a driving personal force behind the wave of industrial consolidation in the United States at the turn of the 20th century. Over the course of his career on Wall Street, Morgan spearheaded the formation of several prominent multinational corporations, including U.S. Steel, International Harvester, and General Electric. He and his partners also held controlling interests in numerous other American businesses, including Aetna, Western Union, the Pullman Car Company, and 21 Railroads. Of course, Aetna, um, many might know today as a medical insurance company. Through his holdings, Morgan exercised enormous influence over capital markets in the United States. During the Panic of 1907, he organized a coalition of financiers that saved the American monetary system from collapse. Well, most people today would not believe that that is, was a great thing, this salvation of the so-called monetary system, which is not actually American. It's just relegated to the Americas, but it is not American. It was not made by American interests. And it's all for the benefit of the internationalist controllers, mostly based out of Europe. So all of these individuals going about doing their crimes, they all are leading to one thing. Our current system of transport and travel, highly regulated and highly controlled. The first of these highway systems was called the Lincoln Highway, is one of the first transcontinental highways in the United States and one of the first highways designed expressly for automobiles. Conceived in 1912 by Indiana entrepreneur Carl G. Fisher and formally dedicated October 31st, 1913, the Lincoln Highway runs coast to coast from Times Square in New York City West to Lincoln Park in San Francisco. The full route originally ran through 13 states, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Indiana, Illinois, Iowa, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, Utah, Nevada, and California. In 1915, the Colorado Loop was removed, and in 1928, a realignment rooted from rooted the Lincoln Highway through the northern tip of West Virginia, or routed. Thus, there are 14 states, 128 countries, and more than 700 cities, towns, and villages through which the highway passed at some time in its history. The first officially recorded length of the entire Lincoln Highway in 1913 was 3,389 miles. Over the years, the road was improved and numerous realignments were made, and by 1924, the highway had been shortened to 3,142 miles, counting the original route or route and all of the subsequent realignments. There has been a grand total of 5,872 miles. The Lincoln Highway was gradually replaced with numbered designations after the establishment of the U.S. numbered highway system in 1926, with most of the route becoming U.S. Route 30 from Pennsylvania to Wyoming after the interstate highway system was formed in the 1950s. Former alignments of the Lincoln Highway were largely superseded by Interstate 80 as the primary coast-to-coast -coast route from New York City area to San Francisco. And naturally, all, most of this culminates with Henry Ford, July 30th, 1863 to April 7th, 1947, was an American industrialist and business magnate. As the founder of the Ford Motor Company, he is credited, credited as a pioneer in making automobiles affordable for middle-class Americans through the system that came to be known as Fordism. Ugh. I hate these Wikipedia articles. In 1911, he was awarded a patent for the transmission mechanism that would be used in Model T and other automobiles. Ford was born in a farmhouse in Spring Wells Township, Michigan, and left home at the age of 16 to find work in Detroit. It was a few years before this time that Ford first experienced automobiles, and throughout the latter half of the 1880s, he became repairing and later constructing engines, and through the 1890s worked with the division of Edison Electric. He founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903. After prior failures in business, but success in constructing automobiles. And one has to expect that most of these names and individuals are fake. They weren't real, and there were probably people going around operating under their, under that name, but they were, they were caricatures, essentially. As we have today, caricatures pretending to be uh, heads of state, 
So in this context of the control of transport and travel revolving around the automobile system that we have today, Owens Corning is an American company that develops and produces insulation, roofing, and fiberglass composites and related materials and products. It is the world's largest manufacturer of fiberglass composites and was formed in 1835 as a partnership between two major American glasswork, Corning Glassworks and Owens, Illinois. The company employs approximately 19,000 people around the world. Owens Corning has been a Fortune 500 company every year since the list was created in 1955. Pink Panther acts as the company's mascot and appears in most of their advertisements. 1935 to 1980, Owens Corning Fiberglass Company was formed in 1935 through the merger of Owen, Illinois and Corning Glass Works. It became a separate company in 1938 with its headquarters established in Toledo, Ohio. In 1938, the company's sales reached $2 million. The company held its initial public offering in the New York Stock Exchange in 1952. In 1955, Owens Corning purchased land for a research and testing facility near Granville, Ohio. Also in 1955, Owens Corning made the first Fortune 500 company list. The company has been on the Fortune 500 list ever since its creation. So this was copy and paste as usual with Wikipedia from all of the regurgitated nonsense that one finds in the disgusting education system, which isn't really an education system. In 1965, Owens Corning Fiberglass Europe was formed. In 1966, Owens Corning established a partnership with Armstrong Rubber Company to produce fiberglass reinforced automobile tires. And there you have your element with automobile. Next, OI Glass Inc. is an American company that specializes in container glass products and is one of the world's leading manufacturers of packaging products, holding the position of largest manufacturer of glass containers in North America, South America, Asia Pacific, and Europe after acquiring BSN Glass Pack in 2004. While legally known as Owens Illinois Incorporated, the company changed its trade name to OI in 2005 group its global operations under a single cross-language and cross-culture brand name. The company's headquarters were previously located at 1 Seagate, Toledo, Ohio. The headquarters were moved in late 2006 to the Levi's Commons Complex in Perrysburg, Ohio. The company is the successor to the Owens Bottle Company founded in 1903 by Michael Joseph Owens, who made the first automated bottle making machine, and Edward Drummond Leiby. In 1929, the Owens Bottle Company merged with Illinois Glass Company to become Owens Illinois Incorporated. Six years later, Owens, Illinois, merged with Corning Incorporated to form, or form Owens Corning. In 1971, Owens, Illinois, produced an early commercial plasma display, the DigiVu. Until July 2007, the company was also a worldwide manufacturer of plastics packaging with operations in North America, South America, Asia, Pacific, and Europe. Plastics packaging products manufactured by OI included containers, closures, and prescription containers. In July 2007, OI completed the sale of its entire plastics packaging business to Wrexham, a United listed packaging manufacturer. Owens, Illinois was a part of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. Blah, blah, blah. I don't really care about any of the rest of the stuff. It's not exactly important. So the main themes that we see here today is primarily control of transportation and travel systems. And within those transportation travel systems, you have the focus on uh, education and the medical industry. With all of these parent magnates, they all focus on universities, schools, and hospitals. And naturally, that is the horrible situation and system that we see being having been constructed today. It all comes from the effort of these individuals, or alleged individuals, and all of their juridical entities. Now we have Corning Incorporated, it is an American multinational technology company that specializes in specialty glass, ceramics, and related materials and technologies, including advanced optics. Primary for industrial and scientific applications, the company was named Corning Glassworks till 1989. Corning divested its consumer product lines, including Corning Wear and Visions, py Pyroceram based cookware. Corel Vitrell Tableware and Pyrex Glass Bakeware. In 1998, by selling the Corning Consumer Product Company subsidiary, later Corel brands known as Instant Brands to Borden. As of 2014, Corning had five major business sectors display technologies, environmental technologies, life sciences, optical communications, and specialty materials. Corning is involved in two joint ventures Dow Corning and Pittsburgh Corning, Quest Diagnostics and Covents were spun off from Corning in 1996. Corning is one of the main suppliers to Apple Incorporated. 
since working with Steve Jobs in 2007 to develop the iPhone. Corning develops and manufactures Gorilla Glass, which is used by many smartphone makers. It is one of the world's biggest glass makers. Corning won the National Medal of Technology and Innovation four times for its product and process innovation. So here we come to yet another conflict around mode of transportation and travel, but one that is more of a symptom rather than a cause or a primary conflict over such a thing. Competition for fares in Chicago was fierce in the 1920s, and drivers began ganging up on one another between fares. The fighting between the two cab companies escalated to the point of warfare, sparked by the murder of Frank Sexton, who was attempting to organize taxi drivers. In retaliation, Patrick Sexton, Frank's father, killed Jack Rose, who had been accused of the murder, as Rose was being led from an arraignment hearing. As the war escalated, Martin's home was firebombed in June 1923, which was another factor prompting Martin to relocate Checker Cab Manufacturing to Michigan. In 1925, Hertz sold Yellow Coach to General Motors, which reorganized it as Yellow Truck and Coach. However, Hertz retained stakes in Yellow Taxi operators in both Chicago Yellow Cab and New York Yellow Taxi. The Model H2 was succeeded by the Model E 1924, Model F 1926, and Model G 1927. All derived from the original Mogul Taxi of 1918, the F could be distinguished by its angled windshield and had a Landoilette option for the passenger compartment roof while G was the first to offer a six-cylinder Buddha engine as an option to the four-cylinder Buddha previously offered, or Buddha. Finally, breaking from the mobile tax ancestor, or taxi, Checker introduced the Model K in October 1928, riding on a 100 or 127 in a 3,200 millimeter wheelbase powered by a six-cylinder Buddha. Hertz had, some cons had, Hertz had sold the controlling interest in the Yellow Cab Company to the Parmalee Transportation Company. But in 1929, after a suspicious fire at his stables killed his prized racehorses, Hertz sold his remaining shares of Yellow Cab to Markin, who subsequently acquired another one-third in the company from Parmalee, thus taking control of both Parmalee and Yellow Cab. Model K was succeeded by the Model M 1930 and Model T 1932. Model T was badge engineered and sold as the Auburn Safety Cab in 1933. In 1940, Parmalee, including Yellow and Checker Cab, became the largest cab company in the United States. GM had wanted to sell part of the acquired Yellow Coach business and made an offer to Markin, but Markin declined. Rather than eliminate the capacity of Yellow Coach, General Motors entered the taxi cab business in New York City as Terminal Taxi Cab. General Motors operated Yellow Coach as a subsidiary until 1943, at which time the company was merged with GMC Truck Division and manufacturing shipped, shifted from Chicago to Pontiac, Michigan. A second taxi war broke out in the early 1930s with Checker Taxi Company and Terminal Taxi Company operators fighting it out in New York City. GM flooded the market with its general cab offered to taxi operators for U.S. $360 down and no contract. Predictably, drivers took advantage of the generous terms, deferring maintenance and delaying their monthly repayments until they turned the cars back to GM in various states of disrepair. Tend to dispute New York Mayor Jimmy Walker created the New York Taxi Cab Commission, now called the New York City Taxi and Limousine Commission, which issued a number of cab operator permits called taxi medallions and mandated that cabs have seating for five passengers in the rear compartment, which favored Checker and a handful of other manufacturers that built automobiles, which met this requirement. Over the next three decades, Markin was involved in the formation of Checker Taxi or Checker Cab Companies in several major U.S. cities. In August 1933, Markin sold Checker Cab, manufactured by Eric Loban Cord, and bought it back again in 1936. Markin and Cord were friends, and after Cord bought up interest in Checker, he retained Markin as a company head. Meanwhile, the large, heavy Checker Model T, introduced in 1932, featured an eight-cylinder Lycoming engine, the same one that powered the classic Cords at the time. Checker had used Lycoming six-cylinder engines since the introduction of the Checker Model G in 1927. Prior to that, most Checkers had been powered by four-cylinder Buddha engine. Now we come to something, a uh, website article from OpenTug. There are a number of different transportation modes available for shipping goods in the U.S. logistics industry. The U.S. boasts a robust transportation system from busy airports to sprawling rail networks and endless highways. But does the U.S. logistics network have options that can be more cost-effective and sustainable than the traditional modes accepted by most organizations? In this blog post, we'll dive into shipping over land, inland waterways. But first, let us quickly understand the full landscape of transportation modes. 
Like most countries globally, U.S. logistics mainly rely on three shipping methods, air, rail, and truck. Air, with the rise of e-commerce and the need for faster deliveries, many shippers have preferred air freight. It is fast, efficient, and ideal for perishable goods or high-valued items. However, it is also the most expensive mode of transportation. Rail, railways offer a cost-effective solution for transporting bulk goods over long distances from coal to grain. Railways transport an extensive range of commodities. Truck flexibility and door-to-door -door service make trucking a favorable option among shippers. This mode of transport is best for short to medium distances and can cater to a wide range of goods. Yet in this vast network lies the largely untapped sector, inland marine shipping. Only about 5% of all freight in the United States moves on river barges, making it a sector ripe for, ripe for exploration. What is inland marine shipping? What value does it offer over the other modes discussed? And is it relevant in 2023? We find answers to all these questions below. Now, this highlights something without really talking about the obvious, which is that it used to be that most shipping throughout the United States was done on rivers, or, as this says, inland marine shipping. It is not something to be explored, considering it was already explored many times by many different people groups. Now, the fact that they've removed all that information is something else, which, of course, would require those things to be re-explored. However, with all the dams and all the other projects that block the road, riverways, it's no surprise that only about 5% of all freight in the United States moves on river barges now. Right? That's what it's leaving off, is that that's what's done now. And I'm sure Cornelius Vanderbilt, along with all of the others, they all had something to do working together with driving out anything that might challenge their control, mainly travel over the rivers. Now, of course, rail, as most people would know, is more expensive for transporting oneself or traveling than air is. But that's soon to change because the airline prices are getting pretty close, if not at the same cost as it is to take a trip over rail. And eventually, which is what we're going to look at next, travel by vehicle using petroleum will be the same thing. And that's all thanks to the work of those individuals, alleged individuals that we saw before, forcing a dependency on one particular or these basically three particular modes of transportation so that they can then restrict and control the free movement of peoples and goods. To start with, we'll look at a article from Marketplace by Kaylee Wells, May 13th, 2024. The U.S. exports more petroleum than it imports. So why are we importing at all? And here follows one of the stupidest explanations for that question. If you notice that you're paying more at the pump at some point over the next few weeks, that may be because you are buying a different blend of gasoline as stocks of winter gas run out and refineries nationwide switch to producing summer blends. Sounds like he's talking about beer. To feed those refineries, last year the U.S. imported more than 8.5 million barrels of petroleum a day. Meanwhile, the U.S. also exported more than 10 million barrels a day. Wait, what? Why are we selling that oil instead of using it ourselves? It's mostly a chemistry problem. The crude oil we're buying is thick and has lots of sulfur, hence it's called heavy sour. Right? Sounds like he's talking about beer. The stuff we're pulling up isn't and doesn't, so it's called light sweet. Like the differences between IPAs and porters. <laughs> he said our refineries were designed to process oil coming from Mexico and Venezuela, and a lot that trends to be tends to be relatively heavy and relatively high in sulfur, he said. So this person's, what they're really saying is that this whole system was designed this way. That comes down to the Keynesian internationalist economic system of enforced, uh, well, what is that term that they use all the time? It's uh, enforced scarcity. That's what they call it, scarcity. They make sure that you're dependent on something, and then they make that something scarce and ensure that they're the only ones that control it. Thus, they can leverage that control into everything else and thus take over any semblance of freedom that ever existed in every place, including housing, transportation, uh, travel, food, water, absolutely everything. 
Then a little over a decade ago, shale fracking took off in the U.S. and so did the supply of light sweet oil. Yeah. And I'm not going to read the rest of this. It's basically all going to sound like some brain-dead idiot from, you know, what institution uh, who thinks that oil is the, akin to brewing beer. So now we come to Ballotpedia. The crude oil export ban prohibited most crude oil exports from the United States to other countries. It was implemented in 1975 and lifted in December 2015. Due to an increased use of hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, and horizontal drilling beginning in 2005, the United States increased its production of oil and natural gas. Opponents of the ban argued repealing it would increase job growth and domestic energy production. Proponents of the ban argued that its repeal could lead to higher domestic gasoline prices and negatively affect U.S. jobs at U.S. refineries. And naturally, both of these things were planned. So they implement the so-called ban first to drive up the domestic production. Now, once they've driven up the domestic production, then they lift the ban so that all of that production goes somewhere else. This is the same tactic repeated over many times in many ways and in many places. And it's essentially the same thing that Standard Oil did in partnership with Pinkerton thugs, what we now call police, and the uh, phony government, right? The U.S. Code government of Washington, D.C. In 1973, Arab members of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, an intergovernmental organization, imposed a ban on petroleum exports to the United States and to other countries that supported the state of Israel during the 1973 Arab-Israeli conflict. Hmm, sound familiar? OPEC also cut oil production, leading to rising gasoline prices in the United States. At the time of the embargo, U.S. policies encouraged oil imports over domestic oil production. In response to the embargo and higher domestic gasoline prices, Congress passed the 1974 Energy Policy and Conservation Act, which directed the president to ban crude oil exports except for select types of oil. On September 10, 2015, the House Energy and Power Subcommittee approved a bill to allow crude oil exports. The U.S. House of Representatives voted on October 9, 2015, to lift the crude oil export ban, the two 61 to 159 vote passed through the measure stalled in the Senate. Or though the measure stalled in the Senate. President Barack Obama D prom promised to veto the bill. The Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2016, H.R. 2, 1029, included a provision to end the export ban. It passed both houses of Congress and was signed by President Obama on December 18, 2015. Full text of the spending bill can be ac accessed here. And now we come to the current kicker in this comedy of, well, it's not really comedy, but in the overall operation around transportation and travel. After reports that a 50-year-long petrodollar agreement between Saudi Arabia and the U.S. failed, some warned of the U.S. dollar's global demise. What actually happened? Contradictions. Some said the agreement required Saudi Arabia to keep oil prices in dollars, but others said that wasn't the nature of the deal. For context, in 1974, the countries reportedly struck a then-secret agreement to swap U.S. aid for Saudi Arabia's investment of petrodollars in U.S. treasuries. There's been an implicit agreement to keep oil prices in dollars since the 1970s, but nothing official. Market Watch Center bias told all sides. Oil is typically priced in dollars worldwide, though Saudi Arabia has recently signaled openness to accepting other currencies. I don't know what they're attempting to... Um, deny there. Donovan's narrative, Paul Donovan, chief economist at UBS Global Wealth Management, yeah, that's an honest organization, explained the agreement while noting that oil has always traded in non-dollar currencies and that contrary reports were born from confirmation bias. Yeah, I've definitely heard that crap before. In the crypto world, where many desperately want to believe in the dollar's demise. Donovan said Saudi Arabia has indicated it was happy to negotiate oil sales and other currencies. Market Watch told all sides that practically all of the Saudis' oil revenues are priced in dollars. How the media covered it, outlets like Straight Arrow News, Center Bias, and Newsmax, Lean Right Bias, reported that the agreement to keep oil priced in dollars fell through. Though they were contradicted by Market Watch and Zero Hedge, Lean Right Bias, who focused on Donovan's claim that the story was fake news. 
And last element in this relation to the control of oil or control of transportation and travel. U.S. oil export surge drawing crude away from storage hub. U.S. oil, and this is from Reuters, U.S. oil exports have climbed following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'd say alleged because I don't believe anything's going on there. And barrels of domestic oil that would typically go to the Cushing, Oklahoma storage hub are instead being exported via the Gulf Coast traders instead. The invasion through the oil market and disarray as companies stop buying Russian oil and prices skyrocket. Worldwide buyers are looking to source crude wherever they can, and exports have risen in recent weeks from the United States, the world's largest crude producer. So yes, they're using this phony war as a cover to ship out all the oil reserves, all the wealth from the country, so that when people finally come to deal with these people, they will have control over all the commodities and resources, and thus can enforce a do what we tell you, or we'll just cut everything off, basically. Cushing, Oklahoma, known colloquially as the crossroads of the oil industry, is where holders of U.S. West Texas Intermediate Futures contracts take delivery. Its vast storage capacity means it's still considered a guidepost for U.S. inventories, even as barrels have shifted to the Gulf after Washington lifted the U.S. ban on exports in 2015. U.S. crude exports rose to 3.8 million barrels per day for the March 18-week highest since July 2021. U.S. Energy Department data showed Cushing stockpiles are currently at 25.2 million barrels, just off a four-year low reached in early March.